Dr. Jackson, yeah. can we yeah. move on to the next speaker? We will just move on with the next talk. Uh, this is by Dr. Shantanu Sen Gupta. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Shantanu is over there. Yeah. Uh, so welcome, Dr. Shantanu. And uh, Dr. Shantanu Sen Gupta is the chief scientist at uh, CSIR IGIB, uh, New Delhi, and uh, professor of the Academy of uh, Sciences and Innovative Research. So he did his postdoc uh, at NI, New Delhi, and then at Cleveland Clinic Foundation, Ohio, USA. And he came back and then set up the proteomic and metabolic uh, metabolomics facility at IGIB, where his research focuses on clinical proteomics and metabolism, metabolomics, and working towards understanding genetic, proteomic, and metabolomic basis of cardiovascular disease. So his study has uh, shown some very interesting finding where he showed that uh, coronary artery disease is significantly associated with uh, deficiency of vitamin B12. He is currently working towards identifying markers for coronary, art coronary artery disease and other cardiovascular disorders. And uh, he has also published a number of papers and also the academic editor for PLOS One and the Journal of Protein and Proteomics. He has been the he has received the DBT Bioscience Award in 2011 and is a fellow of National Academy of Science and West Bengal Academy of Science and Technology. So today he is going to talk about understanding cardiovascular disease in India and in, an integrated omics approach. So welcome Dr. Shantra and over to you. Thank you. Thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, is my slide visible? Uh, yeah, right now. Yeah, perfect. Okay. So. Uh, I would first like to thank the organizers, especially Dr. Shiv Kumar, for uh, inviting me today. Uh, I would also start by thanking Jason because he has made my life easier by talking about uh, proteomics and multiomics data and, and its importance. Uh, today, I'm going to talk to you about uh, you know, a very familiar disease, cardiovascular disease in India and how we are trying to understand the disease, trying to identify some markers, <coughs> specifically for Indian population. Uh, obviously, why cardiovascular disease? And I think you all know it's the leading cause of uh, mortality and morbidity worldwide. And uh, what is most disconcerting, that uh, low and middle income countries are disproportionately affected as and you can see that India probably is today the capital of uh, coronary artery disease, and it is uh, estimated that 60 percent of the world's cardiac coronary artery disease patients will be Indians. So we are one six, 16 percent of the world's population, but by 2030, it is estimated that 60 percent of the CAD patients will be Indians. And what is worse is, even till date. India does not have a dedicated uh, national cardio metabolic disease institute. So I think one of the priorities should be to, to understand the disease in a much better way. Uh, so anyway, so when we started this journey and I, I'm what I'm trying to tell you is a work of uh, probably last 15 years and also I'll share with you what we plan in the next five years. So, like every other co complex diseases, CAD also has genetic factors and environmental factors. Intentionally, I have not uh, talked about env other environmental factors, but I'll talk today about some nutri nutritional factors. <coughs> and together, they uh, could alter the epigenetic factors. What are the epigenetic factors? As Jason pointed out, it could be methylation, it could be stone modification, it could be acetylation, it could be a lot of things. And once the uh, there is alteration in epigenetic factors, it is assumed that there will be change in the transcriptome. And if there is a change in transcriptome, there could be a differential proteome and then differential metabolome. Although you have seen in the previous uh, lecture that the correlation is not that great, but we expect that this should happen. Uh, now, coming to the genetic factors, it was thought initially that, you know, Indians are more prone to cardiovascular disease uh, and it is because it is in our genes. 
So we initiated a study. We did a Jiva study, and we found several, uh, you know, novel loci, and also we found 9p21, which was very, <coughs> which was coming out at that time in in around 2009, 10, uh, or sorry, 2007 to 10. In several studies, we were finding that this 9p21 region was being very important in cardiac diseases as well as diabetes. And sure enough, we also found the same uh, genes to be, uh, you know, the, um, all uh, associated with cardiac disease in our, our country. We also found such, some other novel genes. But, you know, the problem was together, this could not account for the large number of cases that we see. So we thought that we should look at the other factors, other environmental factors. And uh, we, I, my interest was in uh, vitamin B12, and I'll come to that. So we were talking about nutritional factors. Now, even today, if you type the word, a good diet for cardiac diseases, a healthy diet to prevent cardiac diseases, go to Google image, you'll see this, which means that you eat lots of fruits and lots of vegetables. Right. And, and this came from the fact that we all knew from the very beginning and, and a very nice article was published in American Journal of Clinical Nutrition in 99, where it was very clearly shown that mortality from heart diseases are 24 percent lower in vegans. The lower mortality from heart disease among vegetarians was greater at younger ages. But please understand. What do we mean by vegetarian in Western countries and vegetarian in India is completely different. So, for example, if you go to a McDonald's in US and ask for a veggie burger, they will give you a burger with vegetables, but it also has meat in it. To get a pure Indian vegetarian burger, you have to tell veggie burger without meat. Right. So the concept of vegetarianism is different in different parts of the world. And we argued that Vegetarians might be might develop deficiencies in some essential nutrients, and because of my interest in uh, homocysteine and vitamin B12, vitamin B12 is one of the micronutrients that is sourced only from animal products. There is no plant product which produces vitamin B12, and definitely people uh, with vegetarian diet are deficient in B12. That was known. But what and what does vitamin B12 do? It actually acts as a cofactor for two enzymes in our body. And it's just a cofactor for two enzymes. It has already won three Nobel Prizes. So one of the reactions that it catalyzes is the conversion of homocysteine to uh, methionine in the uh, one carbon metabolism pathway. So what happens is if B12 is deficient, uh, you get more homocysteine, you could get more acetinosyl homocysteine, and acetinosyl homocysteine is a inhibitor of acetinosyl uh, of, of transmethylation reaction. So any DNA methylation, RNA methylation, or protein methylation, the first step is the conversion of SAM to SOC. <coughs> so if you have large elevated homocysteine level, you would get elevated SOC. And that could be an inhibitor of methylation. Also, if homocysteine is high, you could get, because the reaction doesn't go through in this direction, it will go and create more cysteine. And what we hypothesized at that time was a strict vegetarian diet. And I'm talking about 15 years back, this was our hypothesis. Leads to vitamin B12 deficiency, which could lead to hyperhomocysteinemia and hypercysteinemia. Hyperhomocysteinemia were at that time considered to be independent risk factor for cardiac diseases. So we looked at vitamin B12 status in a DBT project. We were looking at uh, the status in nine different states. And you can see here, uh, total cholesterol, LDL, TG, which are usually considered to be the culprits in normal population, they are only about 20% deficient. But 50% of the Indians have low HDL, and they also have low active B12. What is interesting is when we looked at vegetarians and non-vegetarians, uh, we found that uh, definitely vegetarians, as expected, had, had significantly lower levels of B12. But even 
the non-vegetarian uh, people who consume non-vegetarian diet also had less uh, amount of B12. The, the median level is about 200. So the, uh, the normal level is 200. And here, even in non-vegetarians, we see only 270. This in Western population is more than 400. So we found that 55% deficient B12 and 70% had high plasma homocysteine levels. When we then looked at cases and controls, interestingly, we found that low B12 was associated with cardiac disease, but it was not homocysteine, but cysteine, high levels of cysteine which were associated. And so we argued that because B12 is low, homocysteine is not being converted to methionine and is going down to cysteine and you get accumulation of cysteine. <clears throat> and that's probably why B12, low B12 and high cysteine are associated with the cardiac disease in India. So that led us to three questions. Why is B12 low in Indians? Is it only because of vegetarianism? Is B12 deficiency associated with dyslipidemia? Because we know that dyslipidemia is one of the major causes of cardiac disease. And what is the role of cysteine? I'm not going to talk about the third point today. We had the, over the years used yeast as a model system to mechanistically study what yeast is doing. Those are all published studies. But I'll just give you a glimpse of the first two questions. So coming to why is B12 low in Indians? So if you uh, need to address that, let us understand how B12 is metabolized. So once you take in food which has B12, it binds to a protein called haptocorin, and, and this is also known as transcobalamin 1. And it, it, it can never travel free. It is always bound to some protein or the other. So in the stomach, because of the change of pH, hap, it is released from haptocorin, and then it binds to intrinsic factor. This is another protein. And then again, it goes to the ileum. And there, again, because of change in pH, it, it is... It, it is free from intrinsic factor and binds to a protein known as transcobalamin 2. And this B12 bound to transcobalamin 2 is what enters the cell. So only about 20 to 30 percent of total B12 enters into the cell and is known as active B12. Now what happens is, if you have a problem in intrinsic factor secretion, which, which often is due to gastritis, which is often due to helicobacter pylori infection, then the binding of B12, so you may be eating B12 rich diet, but your absorption of B12 is less, and so intracellular B12 is less. And in India, it is estimated that almost 70 to 80 percent of people have deficiency in intrinsic factor, uh, or our hel helicobacter pylori infection, uh, 70 to 80 percent has, and they, thereby could have intrinsic factor, low levels of intrinsic factor. So this is one of the reasons. And this is exactly the reason why even in non-vegetarians, probably in India, we have low levels of B12. The other is obviously genetic. And there were studies where it was shown that in nature genetics, that fucosal transfer is two gene. The common variants of this gene are associated with vitamin B12 deficiency. And that has been replicated. In fact, in India, we also did a study and we found that if you have GGLE, the vitamin B12 level is the lowest, whereas if you have AA genotype, the, the vitamin B12 level is the highest. And interestingly, in Western population or in Indo-European, the frequency of GLE is 0.49, whereas the frequency of GLE in Indians is 0.7. So what is a minor allele in Western population is a major allele in Indian population. So what, what happens if you have this allele? So this allele actually renders an individual susceptible to H. pylori infection, which, which actually is be found to be more frequent in our country. So interestingly, fucosyl transference, it transfers uh, the sugar fucose to cell membranes and H. pylori is attracted to some of the uh, uh, to these fucosyl uh, fucose uh, fucose uh, sugar, and so it binds more in individuals with GG genotype, and that is one of the reasons why we find that B12 deficient uh, Indians are more B12 deficient. So one is they take vegetarian diet, two 
they probably have more H. pylori infection, and that probably is because of uh, fucosyl transferase genotype. And because of this, their absorption is a problem. So both intake and absorption is a problem in India. That's why the levels of B12 are low. That's fine. We understood why B12 is low, but <clears throat> does it lead to anything? Does it lead to dyslipidemia? And why we ask this question is because of two initial observations that B12 was correlated with low levels of HDL. So if you have low B12, we have low HDL. And the second, uh, a small experiment was done in macrophages where we made the macrophages B12 deficient. And uh, we, we uh, provided cholesterol in the media. And we found that if you have B12 deficiency, there is 42% net increased influx and 15% increased efflux, which means that there is a net 27% cholesterol accumulation in cells. These were the initial studies which led us to think that B12 could lead to dyslipidemia. And what we did was we used a maternal B12 deficient rat model in collaboration with CCMB and IICB to see what happens to the uh, next generation of a vitamin B12 deficient mother. And why did we look at mothers? Because you know, it, it is uh, shown by several groups in India <coughs> that during pregnancy, B12 deficiency is more prevalent in uh, mothers. And we know that in utero, uh, nutrition experiences, according to Barker hypothesis, leads to risk factors uh, like CVD, obesity, hypertension, in the uh, later life and this could be due to dna methylation and so what we did i'm trying to go a little bit faster here we generated this model we took uh, uh, the rats uh, uh, some of them we gave b12 deficient diet for three months and then we found that the mothers at three months who were on b12 deficient diet were 27 percent deficient in b12 and we mated them with controls and in a subsection of these b12 deficient mothers during conception, we rehabilitated them with B12 to see if the effect that we are seeing because of maternal B12 deficiency is reversed when they are rehabilitated with B12. So you can see here, as usual, in this, in, uh, the mothers were 27% deficient, but you can see the male pups were about 70% deficient in B12 and females were about 65 to 70 again. Interestingly, the level of homocysteine was high in case of males, was high also in case of females, but not that high. The levels of cysteine was high only in case of males and not in females. Total fat was higher in male pups, not in females. The levels of HDL was low in males, not in females. And most interestingly, the levels of triglyceride we are higher in males, not in females. So clearly, we can see that there is a sex-specific differentiation of the same new, uh, micronutrient in males and females. So what then we asked was, what is going on? Could we use proteomics, methyl methylation studies to understand what actually is going on? And so uh, what Jason pointed out is proteomics. I'm not going to go in details. We did a uh, relative quantitative proteomics. We got about 2,000 samples uh, in, in each of the uh, groups. And what again we found that B12 deficiency, you can see the heat map here. There is a complete different signature in case of males and females. So B12 deficiency leads to sex specific differential protein expression. So parallelly, we were also establishing methods on DNA methylation, and we were the first to do a Medib sequence in a rat tissue at that uh, at the, during that time, and then we compared to. So what we found in DNA methylation is in a B12 deficient um, uh, uh, pups, we found about 200 regions which were hypermethylated and 142 which were hypomethylated. But once you give the mothers, you have rehabilitated the mothers at conception. 186 out of these 214 and 134 of these 142 actually revert back to control levels, which means that there is an epigenetic mechanism going on. And if the mother is supplemented during conception, then these come back and this also proves causality. So the pathways that were enriched were fatty acid metabolism, PPR signaling pathway, etc. 
And now if you compare it with proteomics again, you can see PPR signaling pathway. And if you uh, we, we, uh, combine, if you look at the pathways that are commonly <coughs> differential in the DNA methylation as well as uh, proteomics, you can find PPR signaling pathway, amino acid metabolism, one carbon is expected, uh, carbohydrate metabolism, energy metabolism, fatty acid synthesis, and steroid hormone biosynthesis. This could be one of the reasons why we see six specific difference uh, in the effect. And one interesting thing is PPR actually is a transcription factor, and I'll show you in the next slide that PPR is responsible for amino acid, uh, uh, carbohydrate, and energy metabolism uh, um, proteins. So they regulate that. So we looked at PPR alpha. If you do a DNA methylation, if you do a bisulfide sequence in the promoter of uh, PPR alpha, and I'll just give you one example here. The green one, the green line is the control. The red one is B12 deficient, while the gray one is which has been rehabilitated at conception. So, so, so you can see in general, the red one has high methylation in PPR promoter. But look at this CPG site, which is labeled as 2 here. So you have almost 80% uh, density of methylation in, at this CPG site uh, in B12, uh, in, in PAPS bond to B12 restricted mothers. But in PAPS bond to control, there is absolutely no methylation here, which means that this could lead to silencing of PPR alpha. So PPR alpha could be low, and this happens in males, not in females. And if you supplement uh, B12, you know, it comes down to an average value, so the, uh, the density of methylation reduces. So these, this is one example that I just showed you. And when we looked at the proteins, now you can see if you look at this, that in males, this is controlled, this is B12 restricted. So in males, actually, PPR alpha is low in B12, in, in pubs bond to B12 uh, restricted mothers. Why? In females, the levels are high. So this is interesting, and PPR actually has a uh, connection to uh, estrogen receptors. So as I was telling you, PPR regulates amino acid, carbohydrate, and lipid metabolism. So we looked at the uh, metabolites in all these pathways. We looked at amino acid. You can see here, these are males, these are females. So there is more or less changes happening in males, not that much in females. Even in uh, glycolysis, in, in the carbohydrate metabolism, we saw that all these arrows that has been pointed out to be down-regulated is in males, but in females there is absolutely no change. What is happening to the lipids? So we, we what we did was, uh, you know, uh, lipid. The, the, there are not many methods by which you can detect large number of uh, lipid species. So we went on and used mass spectrometry-based method where you can detect 883 odd lipids with CV less than 30 percent, uh, consisting of 17 lipid classes, and this is a paper which has just been published. And we can detect isomers also, and I'll come to the utility later on. But I'm not going to talk about this paper. You can find it, you can read it. If you have any queries, please let me know. So we use this technique in liver, and we found that in liver of males, cholesterol ester and cholesterol are high. But those are not true in females. Whereas intracellular in the tissue, triglycerides are low, but in females they are normal. So what we believe is, you know, there is a uh, fatty acid degradation happens for energy, and PPR alpha is an inhibitor of fatty acid oxidation. So if you have low PPR alpha, you you it in uh, you know PPR alpha is actually responsible for fatty acid oxidation. So if you have low PPR alpha, your fatty acid oxidation will be lower. There is lipogenesis going on in liver, so it generates triacylglycerol. Those triacylglycerol, because they are not, uh, you know, uh, degraded uh, because of low PPR alpha, they will come into circulation and that's why we get high plasma triglycerides in males. On the other hand, PPR alpha is also responsible for Synthesis of apolipoprotein A1. Apolipoprotein A1 is the protein which has the uh, which contains HDL. So you have low HDL. PPR low PPR alpha leads to low apo A1 and low HDL in uh, plasma, and that is exactly we, what we got 
low HDL and high triglyceride in plasma is what we had got in case of uh, rats. And that and one of the reasons is we are also getting high accumulation of cholesterol in the cells, not in the plasma. So till now what I showed to you is uh, uh, B12 deficiency leads to increased atherogenic risk in males, not in females. But the problem is we were talking about rats and not humans. So other than fatty acid me metabolism, other functions of PPR alpha are only specific to rodents. Also, rodents have some critical enzymes missing, like cholesterol ester transferase activity is absent in rodents. So to know a human disease, you need to, uh, you, to find a marker, you need to look at humans only. So we now then start, uh, parallelly we were looking at to CAD patients with collaboration from Sandeep Seth uh, in, in All India Institute of Medical Sciences. So we also did proteomics experiments. And interestingly, after three rounds of proteomics, we found four proteins along with diabetes and hypertension could result in an area of under the curve of 0.877, which, which was fairly uh, good. And interestingly, all these four proteins actually belong to reverse cholesterol transport pathway and they are low in uh, cardiac diseases which means that you have low hdl low reverse cholesterol pathway proteins uh, leading to low hdl and this may be one of the uh, hallmarks in indian population we also used uh, the same method and uh, for lipidomics and and looked at uh, uh, the same samples in in uh, what what is their Lipid profile, again, you can see that hypertension and diabetes were uh, status were different in case controls. The rest were not significant. So we did the lipidomics experiment, did some uh, bioinformatic uh, analysis. After doing batch correction and all with the help of my collaborator, Devashis Dak and his student, Anurag. And what we find, I'll just give you a few examples. For example, uh, cholesterol ester, some of them are different and these were found to be uh, replicable from other studies. Phosphatidyl ethanolamine, the, some of them are high, some low and this is exactly the signature that other studies also have found. What was most important, interesting is ceramide and you know the ratio of ceramide uh, 18 to 20 is actually being taken as a screening criteria in Mayo Clinic. And in Indian population also, we found that this is, to, this is true. Now, if you look at triglycerides, there are lots of controversial uh, reports about triglycerides. Most, a lot of studies have shown that triglycerides to be low in cases in India. What we found using this method, we could actually calculate the abundance of various species of triglycerides. Remember, there are triglyceride is not one species. We obtained, we could identify about 300 and 40 species of triglycerides and you can see based on chain length and unsaturation the abundance varies and what we found was <coughs> triglycerides containing long chain fatty acids they were higher in cat patients than controls whereas triglycerides which has short chain fatty acid they were more abundant in controls than cases and we know that short and medium chain triglycerides are actually protective whereas long chain triglycerides are, uh, are, are associated with cardiac disease. And that is exactly why we need mass spec based methods is you, you just can't generalize by looking at triglyceride level. You need to look at their chain length, their unsaturation, and then only comment about it. So this is an example. And in these samples that we have found now, 15% more tag in CAD samples by calculating the uh, area of the peak and the abundance the same samples if we were doing in biochemical uh, analyzer it was showing that controls have more triglyceride than cases so just to summarize we have done genomics we have found several loci we have done dna methylation which we have i have not spoken to you today this is also published i have shown you that four proteins along with uh, diabetes and hypertension could uh, predict about 80 percent of cad cases and in lipidomics, we have just shown you that long chain TGs are elevated in uh, CAD. But remember, these are all case control studies. And just now in the previous uh, talk, Jason very clearly said 
correlation is not causation. So how do we know what is causing it? So one of the ways to do it is to do a prospective longitudinal cohort where you collect people, follow them up for several years. Unfortunately, despite 75 years of independence, India has not a single pan-India cohort, uh, longitudinal cohort study. Uh, and whatever the data we have is from the Framingham study. Every one of us are following the Framingham, but our dietary style is different. Our diet in each part of the country is different. So what we thought a couple of years back was, why don't we create a cohort? What cohort? I mean, CSR. CSR is present in 37 uh, laboratories spread across the country. You can see the places where it is spread. So we thought, why not look at CSR cohort? And we during COVID, we built this up and we uh, performed serology and gave a lot of very interesting insights into the type of infection which have been published in very uh, high impact journals. But uh, what I'm going to show today is you, we are going to use the same cohort and ask this question, can we develop clinically useful personalized risk prediction score for communicable and you know communicable had to be provided given otherwise funding agency was not funding this. Uh, mainly this is meant for cardiometabolic disorders. And what we are trying to do, we have already chalked the plan out. We are not only collecting the samples and doing all the omic studies. We are also going to measure body composition, bone density, fundoscopy, skin testing. We are going to look at uh, liver, lung function, liver function, heart rate variability, etc. So the plan is big. And uh, so we are going to do this on 10,000 samples. And basically, this is what we are trying to do. And then uh, use the power of... Uh, machine learning to try and see if we can create for the first time a, a risk prediction score for Indian population. With that, I'd like to end here. I would like to thank all my collaborators and definitely I would like to thank my students. I'm just here giving the talk. They are these people who uh, work uh, hard and I'm really indebted to uh, the, the great atmosphere created at Institute of uh, Genomics and Integrative Biology. Uh, and I'm also thankful to CSR and DBT for funding. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sengupta, for a wonderful talk and uh, enlightening us about the necessity of vitamin B12 and uh, also the differences that you see between uh, male and female. Many of us uh, carry out animal experiments for like diabetes and uh, only on males to just prevent the influence of the female female hormones. But I think we should uh, try out in uh, both the male and females because there are a lot of other metabolic functions which are quite different. Yes. And, uh, need to be addressed. So yes. thank you, Dr. Sengupta. And uh, we will open it up for uh, maybe one or maximum two questions if there is a. There's nothing from the students. I think there's a huge crowd of students in the convention center at uh, University of Kerala, which is just represented by one online site. I mean, they're they are seeing it on the screen. Okay, I, I hope uh, you will be in touch with Dr. Sengupta to get more information. And definitely, I, I, I would uh, contact you for some other uh, uh, proteomic related uh, collaborations, and uh, we'll see you sure. at the end. Sure. And thanks. thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Sengupta, for a wonderful Thank talk. You.